Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on and um, to the second uh, talk of uh, uh, this part by um, by Johannes Graf. Uh, he's assistant professor um, uh, at the Brain and Mind Institute uh, in the EPFL and uh, his lab is focused on the role of epigenetic mechanisms in molecular processes that uh, govern learning memory and memory loss and uh, he will talk uh, today about uh, memory aids on the chromatin and uh, whether this deciphering epigenetic mechanisms of memory storage and, uh, and change. Uh, thank you, Johannes, for uh, uh, joining us, um, please. Yes, thank you very much for this introduction and uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present here today, although in a virtual format, but uh, I thought the, uh, the talks that we have seen and the discussions that we have had were very interesting so far. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, epigenetic mechanisms and as most of us know epigenetic mechanisms are mechanisms that happen on or above the gene. So that's the pure definition of epigenetics. And as such, those are mechanisms inside the nucleus. Now the nucleus, contrary to maybe kind of the mainstream thinking, is also actually prominently featured in, uh, in Cajal's work. As you can see in the silver uh, nitrate rendering of a pyramidal cell in the hippocampus, where we see the nucleus and in his drawings next to it, where he even discovered uh, his own uh, subcellular uh, compartment in A here, namely the Cajal body, which is implicated in mRNA processing and, uh, and, the, and translation. And of course, we see other subcellular compartments such as the nucleolus uh, in B and the speckles in C, and the nucleus, as you will see, uh, uh, and as we might discuss later this afternoon, I think is uh, probably a little bit of an understudied area in, in neuroscience, and nevertheless, it is important. So epigenetic mechanisms happen inside the nucleus, and those are mechanisms that regulate the compaction of the chromatin as depicted here. So the chromatin can be in its ultra compact form, uh, visible by light microscopy, uh, as a chromosome or in its naked uh, form of the DNA, which spans, uh, depending on the cell type and on the chromosome, one to two meters in length. And epigenetic mechanisms uh, uh, come in different flavors, so they can occur on histones in terms of post-translational modifications and or on the DNA itself. And common to the mechanisms is that they wrap more or less the chromatin uh, uh, together to locally open up the chromatin or locally loosening it. Now over the past uh, 15 years or so, epigenetic mechanisms have also been found by regulating the compaction of the chromatin to regulate learning and memory. And they do so by orchestrating gene expression programs that are important for synaptic plasticity and learning. So here the idea is that we have synaptic inputs and or environmental stimuli that via intracellular signaling cascades travel to the nucleus where they elicit epigenetic modifications, which in turn leads to changes in gene expression, which in turn signals back to the synapse to alter neuronal and synaptic function. Now in today's talk, I would like to tell you about my own contribution to this field, namely in which uh, uh, I first worked on the process of memory consolidation when I was still a PhD student in Isabel Mansui's lab. Then I started to become interested in different types of memory loss, such as, those, uh, such as the one occurring in Alzheimer's disease. And I continued to do this uh, throughout my postdoc with Li Wei Tsai at MIT, but also uh, in my independent lab, where we then switched from a so-called environmentally induced epigenetic switch to uh, discover genetically determined epigenetic modifications, which promises to be a new avenue of research uh, for the future. And I would like to end this talk by a word of caution and by my thoughts of, uh, uh, of uh, where the field of neuroepigenetics might lead in the future. And this should also be some food for thought for uh, this afternoon's discussion. So then let's start and let's talk about memory consolidation first. 
So memory consolidation is by definition the progressive post acquisition stabilization of long term memory. So this essentially uh, convoluted uh, definition means what happens to a memory once it is learned. This is what consolidation means. And in order to study memory consolidation, we decided to uh, look at a task that is called a novel object recognition task, in which we later at different time points, either 10 minutes post-learning, 24 hours post-learning, or seven days post-learning, look at different histone modifications. And so just to bring everybody up to speed, so the protocol that we used here is a novel object recognition task with two objects, the mouse has time to familiarize itself with the two objects to learn that those are uh, familiar objects. And after these intertrial intervals here, we exchange one object for a new object. And because of the curiosity of the mice, they will, if they have learned the old objects, spend more time with the novel object. And what we did then was to look at different histone modifications and in particular we focused on histone acetylation, histone methylation and histone phosphorylation because the residues that we look at are all implicated in granting access to the transcriptional machinery as depicted here by locally opening up the chromatin. And this is important because we know that the long-term stabilization of memories is dependent on specific gene expression programs. Now, in order to study these histone modifications, we focused on two brain areas, namely the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And what we saw, and this is exemplified by looking at the phosphorylation of histone 3 on amino acid residue uh, uh, serine 10 here, is that in the hippocampus, phosphorylation seems to be increased shortly after learning, so at the time point of the short-term memory, stays elevated for recent memories, so this is the 24-hour time point, but then declines again for remote memories. Now conversely, in the prefrontal cortex, we saw a slightly different scenario, namely that for short-term memories, histone phosphorylation was not different to a habituation time point, but was increased at both recent and persistently so at remote memories. Now this finding is interesting because it is aligned with what is called the standard consolidation theory of memory consolidation that postulates that the hippocampus, although being important very early on, loses its, its importance over the period of consolidation and that there is a spatial temporal shift in the importance of the brain structures that support this process of memory consolidation. In so far that at the same time as the hippocampus loses its importance, the ACC picks up. But irrespective of the theory, what this means is that indeed these epigenetic modifications seem to contribute to memory consolidation. But are they actually also instructive for the memory to be stored? And so in order to test this, what we then did was to infuse before the time point of remote memories, so of seven-day-old memories, a histone post-translation modification inhibitor cocktail that respectively blocks histone phosphorylation, histone acetylation, and histone methylation. And then we measured what happens. So first of all, we measured obviously whether or not this cocktail is efficient in reducing the previously observed increase of these markers. And yes, it brings down these, uh, these uh, increments quite significantly. And interestingly, when we then test for the seven day uh, memory performance, we see that the object memory is significantly impaired, thereby corroborating the notion that these epigenetic modifications, at least the ones that we measured here, they do indeed uh, importantly contribute to memory consolidation. So the next question that I then became interested in to ask was, well, all right, so if they contribute to memory consolidation, how about the opposite? How about memory loss? And in order to study memory loss, we focused on Alzheimer's disease, to which we already had a brief introduction in the previous talk. And 
it's obvious to everyone that Alzheimer's disease is a terrible disease. It is the most prevalent neurodegenerative disease worldwide, and there is currently no cure. Now, physiologically and pathophysiologically speaking, the AD brain depicted here on the right is characterized by a massive shrinkage of the brain that is brought about by substantial neuronal loss and on a protein level by two characteristic hallmarks, namely extracellular accumulates of amyloid beta, fibrils that form plaques, and intracellular accumulates of uh, the tau protein that becomes hyperphosphorylated and forms neurofibrillary tangles. And of course, the most devastating symptom of Alzheimer's disease is cognitive decline, depicted here in orange, that unfortunately starts years, if not decades, after the first pathological signs of amyloid beta occur. So nowadays, Alzheimer's disease is acknowledged to be a combination of both genetic and environmental risk factors. So on the genetic side of things, we can have certain mutations or certain DNA sequence variants that are causally or just predisposing you for developing Alzheimer's disease. On the environmental side of things, it is thought that various stimuli such as hypertension, obesity, smoking, etc., etc., via can lead to a predisposition of developing Alzheimer's disease via epigenetic modifications. But when we started to measure this, we didn't know whether or not there is actually really an involvement of an epigenetic modification in Alzheimer's disease. And in order to study this, we at the time, and this is uh, the work from my postdoc uh, in the Wade Science Lab, focused on an enzyme that we knew was an epigenetic constraint on memory in wild-type animals. Okay, this constraint is called histone deacetylase 2. So the first thing that we then did was to simply measure whether or not we see a change in the levels of this epigenetic enzyme in different models of Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, this was the case. So what we observed in two mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, the CKP25 mice and the 5XFAD mice, were elevated levels of HDEC2, both in the hippocampus and in cortical areas, as depicted here. So in addition to neurodegeneration that is also beautifully visible here on the HDEC2 staining and also on the DAPI staining, we have inside the neurons an upregulation of this protein. This is in mouse models, and we were fortunate enough to collaborate uh, with Boston University, who has a large repertoire of human postmortem brain samples, to confirm these findings in the human AD brain. So we are, what we are now looking at here is HDEC2 levels in the nucleus, depicted here by the white dotted line, that is strikingly increased already at the early stages of Alzheimer's disease and continues to be elevated throughout the disease. So this stage here, Brack and Brack 1, 2, is mild Alzheimer's disease. The next one is moderate Alzheimer's disease. And the last one is severe Alzheimer's disease. Then in a series of mouse in vivo and in vitro experiments, we could show the different types of neurotoxic insults, such as amyloid beta, oxidative stress, CDK5, P25, and others lead to a, a are causally implicated in driving this upregulation of HDEC2. And this happens because they activate a transcription factor, glucocorticoid receptor 1, that becomes phosphorylated, subsequently binds to the promoter region of HDEC2 that contains a glucocorticoid responsive element in its promoter and thereby drives the upregulation of HDEC2. What then happens if HDEC2 is upregulated is that it's removing acetyl groups from the histones, thereby blocking neuroplasticity-related genes. So at the time, we termed this that this upregulation of HDEC2 constitutes an epigenetic blockade of neuroplasticity-related gene expression. Now, of course, this until now was merely a description of what might be happening in the human AD brain and what is happening in the, the mouse, uh, in different mouse models of AD. So in the next step, we then wanted to really 
provide a causative evidence that this upregulation of HDEC2 is really important in driving this phenotype. So in order to study this, we overexpressed an shRNA that targets HDEC2. And what we could show is that indeed this reinstates histone acetylation, thereby opens up the chromatin again and reinstates neuroplasticity-related gene programs. And most importantly, looking at spatial memory with the Morris water maze, we could show that when we overexpress at this shRNA against HDEC2, the memory capacities of the mice were restored back to baseline levels. So what we can see here are control mice treated with a scrambled shRNA, CKP25 mice, one mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, uh, also treated with the scrambled shRNA, and CKP25 mice that have been treated with the shRNA against HDEC2. And what you can see here of the swim path that the animals take is that control mice readily can find the location of where the platform was hidden in the probe trial. CKP25 mice have no clue, they just swim around, whereas CKP25 mice treated with the shRNA against HDEC2 recognize the location where the platform was hidden again. And interestingly, this happened despite persistent neuronal loss. So at first, we were disappointed, I have to admit, to see that the neurodegeneration that is usually seen in CKP25 mice continues to be experienced in CKP25 mice that have been treated with the shRNA against HDEC2. Because obviously it would have been great to also reverse the uh, neuron loss that is so characteristic of AD. However, this is not the case, but what this implies is that the plasticity potential that remains in these neurons can be kindled again, can be brought back, all right? And it means that in addition to neurotoxic insults that lead to acute synaptic dysfunctions that then trigger chronic de cognitive deficits, there is this additional layer of, uh, uh, of hindrance, namely this epigenetic blockade of gene transcription, but which is potentially reversible. And this has led us and many other researchers in the field of neuroepigenetics to focus on pharmacological agents that might be, it might be uh, capable of blocking this epigenetic blockade. And this is depicted here in a review that we published, which is called the potential of the small molecule inhibitors of histone deacetylases called HDEC inhibitors as cognitive enhancers. And this potential is quite big because we and others have shown that different types of HDEC inhibitors can not only rescue contextual fear and spatial memories in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, CKP25 mice, APPPS1 mice, but also in mouse models of neurodevelopmental disorders, such as this one on rubinstein tabi syndrome. And the idea here is that we shift the system, the chromatin landscape that is characterized by specific epigenetic modifications that make up the hills here in this landscape towards one that is going towards a cognitive enhancement. So we can not only rescue cognitive impairment by boosting uh, uh, the system with HDEC inhibitors, but we can also boost normal memory to an enhanced memory. And the idea being that this works not only on restoring histone acetylation and transcription, as I have shown you on the previous slides, but as we and others have shown, this also rescues LTP deficits, this rescues synapse numbers or increases synapse numbers, and this finally then leads to memory retention. So this is obviously an area of investigation that is currently going on by us and others, and I just want to uh, raise your awareness that, for instance, there are currently two clinical trials that test the efficacy or the tolerability of such HDEC inhibitors, either in patients with mild Alzheimer's disease, this is led by Andre Fischer in Germany, or uh, in, uh, in Basel by Dominique de Kerber in a clinical trial where I'm also implicated, where we try to boost the learning that happens throughout exposure therapy for fear of spiders. So this remains to be continued. 
Now, in the following, I would like to stay on this topic of memory loss and on Alzheimer's disease, and I would like to now shift to this genetically predetermined epigenetic modifications. So a few slides back, I told you that Alzheimer's disease is now accepted to be a combination of genetic environmental risk factors. But in fact, what's not so common is to study how these DNA sequence variants over here might lead to epigenetic modifications, which in turn might predispose for a certain type of neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer's. And in order to study this, what we, and this is now work from my own lab, decided to do was to focus on an emerging candidate at the time called PM20D1, which in previous studies had been found to be hypermethylated in Alzheimer's disease. And so the question then became, is this hypermethylation perhaps genetically determined? So in order to go from this modification on the epigenome that we see here, trace it back to a certain DNA sequence variance. And this is what we then studied in the following. And by we, I mean an exceptionally talented postdoc that I was fortunate to have in my lab, Jose Sanchez Mut, who has recently opened his own lab at the Neuroscience Institute in Alicante. So what Jose then did was to focus on the genetic vicinity of PM20D1 on chromosome 1, where we see that there are different genes in its vicinity, and here we see the differentially methylated region, or DMR, of PM20D1. And so in order to trace it back to a genetic variant, what we then looked for were so-called hotspots of genetic variability, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And in particular, we were obviously very much interested to decipher whether or not there are SNPs that have been previously associated with Alzheimer's disease. And the answer is yes. In particular, there was one SNP over here, R7087-27, that depending on the phenotype of this, or on the genotype of this SNP, this increases your odds ratio for developing AD. So if you are an AA carrier, of this SNP, you have a 1.5-fold higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And very interestingly, not only does the genotype of this SNP predict your odds ratio for developing AD, but it nearly perfectly correlates with the DNA methylation at the promoter region of PM20D1. And conversely, since DNA methylation, when it happens in the promoter region, is generally associated with a decrease in gene transcription, we see the inverse correlation between the genotype of R7087-27 and the RNA expression of pm 21 Now, this means that this hypermethylation of pm 21 is strongly correlated with this genotype over here. So the next question that we then ask is, well, how is this actually possible? How does this SNP influence the methylation of pm 21 And so for this, we're now zooming in onto this region further, and we see that these regions are actually separated by 50 kb. So they're quite some distance apart. Now, of course, chromosomes, as they are depicted here, don't exist in nature because chromosomes and, uh, and the chromatin is not a linearized structure but they form different three-dimensional uh, 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 wrappings, okay? So on a chromosomal scale, we can have different chromosomal territories. On a megabase scale, we can have so-called topologically associated domains. And inside these topologically associated domains, we can have at the kilobase scale, so-called chromatin loops. From which follows that we then ask the question, well, could it be that R7087-27 and pm 21 enter into physical contact via a three-dimensional chromatin loop. And this is what we then tested using a technique that is called chromatin configuration capture. And for this, we use genotype-matched immortalized B cells of patients with or without uh, uh, these different genotypes. And the results are shown here. What we could show is that indeed there is a loop between the two, 
but this loop is much more pronounced in GG carriers than in AA carriers. Now, GG carriers shown up here are the ones that have higher PM21 levels on a gene expression level. So what else did we observe? We observed that by using chromatin immunoprecipitation against the mediator of looping, CTCF, that also similar to the loop, on both extremities of the loop, we have an enrichment of CTCF binding. And again, this enrichment happens in the permissive carriers, in the GG carriers. Furthermore, this went along with an enriched binding to GG carriers of RNA polymerase II, and conversely, with a decreased binding of a mediator of transcription repression, MECP2. So to put this in graphical format, what we have found was that in GG carriers, there is indeed a chromatin loop formation that is mediated by CTCF. On GG carriers, we have polymerase II that can bind, PM20 D1 that is expressed. Conversely, in the AA carriers, we have MECP2, a transcriptional repressor that is bound, and PM20 D1 can no longer be expressed. So this means that the two regions physically contact one another. But still, how does RS7087 over here talk to PM20 D1 methylation? And on chromatin terms, talking to one another is looking for enhancer elements. And so this is what we then screened for, looking at two uh, epigenetic modifications that are characteristics of enhancer elements. And indeed, we found that this SNP over here is indeed characterized and enriched for these enhancer elements. And when we ultimately cloned it in front of a luciferase reporter construct, we saw that this element indeed has enhancer properties, stipulating that R7087 indeed acts as an enhancer for PM21. So good, so the two are contacted by one another and they talk to one another. But I still haven't told you what PM21 is actually doing. And this is because this is a PubMed search that was conducted before our paper was published. When we started this project, essentially zero publications were available to tell us what PM21 is actually doing in the brain. Now, of course, we were interested in figuring out what PM21 is doing in the AD brain. And so for this, we did the following series of experiments. First of all, we treated uh, neuronal-like cultures, SHSY5Y cells, with AD-related cellular stressors, such as hydrogen peroxide to mimic oxidative stress or amyloid beta. And we saw that PM21 is upregulated following these cellular stressors. Furthermore, we saw in our mouse model of AD, the APPPS1 mice, that PM21 is upregulated at the symptomatic stages. And importantly, it doesn't seem to be an age-related phenomenon. Furthermore, we see that PM21 is increased in GG carriers who go on to develop AD. Now, I have told you that GG carriers are usually protected from developing AD, and this is true. But nevertheless, among the pool of GG carriers, this is only an odds ratio, among the pool of GG carriers, there's still going to be GG carriers with Alzheimer's disease. And in the few that do, we have an upregulation of PM21. And interestingly, when we look by immunohistochemistry in human postmortem tissue, we see that at the advanced stages of Alzheimer's disease, PM21 depicted in brown here clusters around amyloid plaques. Now, this made us think that in essentially two scenarios can happen. One is that PM21 gets upregulated as a byproduct of all these cellular stressors. Fine. But it's interesting to see that it's upregulated in the usually protected carriers. And it's also interesting to see that it seems to be specifically clustering it around the amyloid plaques. So we reasoned that maybe PM21 indeed has neuroprotective properties. And this is what we then tested in a series of viral overexpression studies. So first of all, we did this in neuronal-like cultures again, where we overexpressed PM21 and saw that these cells survived better after oxidative stress. 
Furthermore, PM20D1 seems to decrease amyloid levels in primary hippocampal neurons, as depicted here. It also decreases amyloid plug load in APPPS1 mice when we stereotactically overexpress PM20D1. So you can see the plugs uh, visualized by methoxy XO4 staining in a mock treated APPPS1 mouse and in an PM20D1 overexpressing APPPS1 mouse. And importantly, coming back to the novel object recognition task that I explained at the beginning, PM20D1 also improves memory performance, not only in this recognition memory task, but also in the Morris water maze. So this lets us to speculate about the, func uh, about the, uh, the following model for PM20D1 functioning in the brain. So AD progression can take different trajectories, one that is delayed in green here, and one that is accelerated, depicted in pink here. So we think that the delayed form is characterized by the unmethylated version of PM20D1, which is something that we mimic with the experimental overexpression of PM20D1. Conversely, and I didn't have the time to show you this data, we think that this accelerated version of AD progression is brought about by the methylated form of PM20D1, which indeed we have mimicked by an experimental downregulation of the protein. So this posits PM20D1, or at least its hypermethylation, as a new risk factor for AD. And what we're currently very much interested in is to decipher also pharmacological tools again aiming at PM20D1 so that we can rescue the phenotype that we have observed. So this leads me now to the last part of my talk where I would like to project ourselves a little bit into the future. And in order to look into the future, it's always good to recapitulate the past. So what have we and others obviously unveiled so far? So first of all, we could show that epigenetic mechanisms are an integral part of learning and memory. Epigenetic mechanisms are critically implicated in memory loss. They can be either environmentally, hydrogen peroxide, amyloid beta, or as we have shown in the last part here, genetically induced. And interestingly, they are amenable to pharmacological interventions. Now, having said this, it's important to realize, and the word of caution is a place here, that these epigenetic mechanisms are but a mere snapshot of the full complexity of the epigenome. Because the combinatorial possibilities of epigenetic mechanisms tends to infinity. So if we look at this in a more zoomed in fashion, we can start to appreciate this complexity. So here are the four core histones, H2A, H2B, H3, H4, and all the amino acid residues that can be epigenetically modified. As you can see, some of them can be modified by different epigenetic modifications. So if we do a little bit of math here and look at just what happens on one core histone or what can potentially happen on one core histone, we can say that this histone here has about 29 modifiable amino acids. So this alone leads to 10 to the 13th number of potential combinations. Now one nucleosome consists of eight core histones and it's estimated that one cell or one neuron has about 30,000 nucleosomes. Now you put this all together and you reach well, close to an infinite number of combinatorial possibilities. Now, despite this word of caution, obviously I believe that the field of nuclear neuroscience or neuroepigenetics is indeed very promising because now we have tools at our disposal that we didn't have it when this field started to grow. And so what we can and what we should do in the future in order to better understand the potential of me epigenetic mechanisms in order to treat or simply to better comprehend memory formation and change is the following. So first of all, we should obviously be more cell type specific. So this is something that we have started to address in Alzheimer's disease, looking at the mere difference 
between gray and white matter DNA methylation. Now you might be surprised, but indeed this has had not been done before. So we don't understand, for instance, we heard a lot about astrocytes before. So we don't understand the epigenetic composition of astrocytes. So this is very much interesting and important going forward. Furthermore, this applies to Alzheimer's disease, but it also applies to fear attenuation or extinction, which is another area of research that we are actively involved, where we have recently identified the, the precise cellular populations that are implicated in this process. So we also have to go after these specific populations of which we know that they are crucially important for memory formation and storage. And finally, we should also do this, obviously, for the pharmacological tools, so for cognitive enhancement. And this is something that we have started to look at on the single RNA level or single nuclear RNA level, where we can see that, for instance, the HDAC inhibitor seems to have a pre predominantly strong effect on oligodendrocytes, microglia, astrocytes, and excitatory neurons in the DG, but not so much in CA1. So this is interesting, and this is something that we have to follow up upon. And so the complexity is sheer endless, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go after the nucleus. And indeed, this brings me back to this original drawing. And I do think the nucleus contains and the epigenetic modifications contain the potential to better understand memory formation and change. And why do I believe so? Well, this brings me back to another famous uh, scientist, Francis Crick, who in 1984 speculated that, for example, memory might be coded in alterations to particular stretches of chromosomal DNA. And with this quote, I would like to end this talk and thank the people involved here. I presented work from my time as a PhD student with Isabel at ETH Zurich, from my time as a postdoctoral fellow with Liu Tsai at MIT, then Carmen, who is actually an alumna of the Cajal Institute, who was a very important person and mentor here during my pre-tenure time at EPFL, obviously all the lab members over the years and the funding agencies, and I look forward to your questions and to the discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes, very much for your talk. And um, so we are open to questions. I can see that there is a question by uh, Richard Morris in the chat. Would you like to uh, phrase your questions, uh, Richard, or? Okay, th thanks, um, Lisa. It, it's just that I was fascinated with the middle talk, your, part of the talk, Johannes, your fascinating dissociation between the uh, continuing cell loss that you saw uh, but the restoration of, of plasticity potential. And I think that's really fascinating as though, you know, there's the sort of disease process, which might be one area of neurobiology to focus on. And then there's the kind of consequence of that for memory. And you seem to have got some handle there. But I'm just wondering if that dissociation is consistent in your mind with the notion of things like sparse information coding, pattern completion, and so on amongst the residual neurons, which will need intact plasticity to function but you may, may only need less neurons for that to happen, provided you have that. I don't know whether you've, what, what your own thoughts about that are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, so we were, we were at first disappointed, but then also intrigued by this finding. Yeah. So we haven't done any more sophisticated tasks here, uh, to be fair. So I, I can't answer directly this question, but what I do think is happening is that if, you're, if you are in a position of a neuron and all your bodies around you are dying because you're in a neurodegenerative neurodegenerating environment, then you have other things to worry about that <laughs> will maintain these higher cognitive functions. Yeah. So I think it comes down to an energy question. So if there is a given set of energy available for a neuron, then the neuron will shut off uh, higher cognitive functions because we know uh, they cost a lot of energy first in order to have more energy at its disposal to fight off neurotoxic insults, DNA damage and, and pro-survival indeed. So the, uh, the, the question related to this is really, so if we, and we haven't done this either, so if we were to, okay, throughout say neurodegeneration, treat continuously with an HDAC inhibitor, then at one point, so maybe, you know, the curve would look like this, the cognitive curve would stay high, the cognitive performance, but at one point it would drop. Yeah. 
Um, this would be the assumption, um, but we haven't done this experiment, but it would be a very important one to do. Very powerful experiment, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah thank you. Uh, so maybe in this direction, I would like to ask uh, regarding, I mean, uh, uh, so cell type specificity, which is something that you mentioned in the last uh, part, is an important uh, context to, to try to qualify whether there is something specific about these um, uh, mechanisms, epigenetic mechanism. But I also wonder regarding synapse specificity, because the way in which memory traces are coded, at least from the electro electrophysiological point of view, is at the level of the tiny ensembles that are built up between different cell types, which connect systematically each other to reflect some events or to try to code for that. So how do you put your uh, results in that context? Do you think that could be something that is specific at the level of the synapse, or do you think it's just a cellular context that matters? So I think in, just in terms of numbers, uh, I mean, you saw the numbers, um, I think it's totally possible that we have as many possibilities on the epigenome that as we have uh, at the synapse. Of course, there's more synapses, one would say, at the neuron, but again, we are not talking, uh, uh, in the nucleus, where we're not talking about one nucleus, we're essentially talking about these different core histones. So I think mathematically this is possible. Now, whether or not this is the case, that's another question. And in fact, so far, I mean, uh, we're never going to understand the full complexity of the epigenome. Um, you know, so I think we, but, and so we're limited by the tools we have. But what emerges from the study so far is that there seems to be some convergence on the epigenome. So you might have, you can think of, you know, synaptic activity reaching a certain threshold that then, you know, triggers intracellular cascades that ultimately reach the nucleus, elicit somewhat conserved epigenetic modifications, conserved, I mean, throughout different memory tasks and throughout different protocols that then ultimately signal back to the, uh, to the synapse. But I, I, I mean, I just have, I mean, I know, you know, synapses are important and that the model of epigenetics does not include, uh, does not exclude synapses at all. But synapses are proteins, and mm -hmm. proteins have a certain half-life. There is a protein degradation machinery, etc. So if you want to maintain a synapse on the long-lasting scale, you have to replenish this pool, and this has to go via mm -hmm. the nucleus. Mm -hmm. so, um, so from that perspective, I think it's, uh, you know, Francis Crick's hypothesis is a very attractive one, mm -hmm. and I think we are now getting closer to have an option to really test this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, I take questions for uh, from uh, the audience. There is one hands hands on. Uh, Irene Serra, please go on. You need to open your uh, microphone. I think the hand was uh, up from a, l a long time ago. Uh, oh, I see. We can, maybe we can oh, go on with other questions and then... Uh... Okay. So we move uh, to questions in the chat. Um, so Jose Maria Frade asked about uh, PM20D1 uh, that is uh, heavily expressed surrounding the amyloid plaques. So he asks whether uh, which cells do express this um, in particular. Microglia, what, what type of cells? Yeah, yeah. So this is a part of an ongoing follow-up project. So indeed, when we look closer at those stainings, they look almost microglia-like. And so what we are now, uh, and well, and also what the, is in the paper, but what I didn't mention is that we only see this reduction of amyloid beta levels when we co-culture neurons and, and glial cells. So when we have a pure neuronal culture, we don't see this. We know also that PM21 can be secreted, but we think it's coming from astrocytes. And more recent evidence even points to the fact that it might be specific to, to microglia. But uh, we don't have a definite answer for this, but that's something that we're looking into, yes. Okay, uh, there is another question by Estrella Fernandez Sevilla. Um, so uh, she wonders whether you have looked at for these epigenetic mechanisms in the opposite memory paradigm. That means abnormal memory retention, like 
post-traumatic injury, uh, post-traumatic um, disorders like behavior, this kind of um, behaviors? Yes, so I mean, we personally have not done so, but uh, there are people who, uh, who look into this and uh, among others in collaboration with the lab at the Dondos Institute, we're currently doing this in a, in a mouse model of PTSD. And so here we see actually that uh, HDEC2 is significantly reduced early on after a traumatic memory has been formed, which, you know, HDEC2 being reduced, you have higher histone acetylation, more gene transcription. So this would speak uh, to the fact that you reduce this protein and so you boost, thereby you boost and, and have this very strong memory that is so characteristic of these traumatic memories. So what we have personally done is um, to look at the difference uh, between recent and remote forms of traumatic memories or fear conditioned memories. And so here we could show that indeed histone acetylation is much reduced at the remote time point than to the recent time point. Uh, and so this uh, prevents memory updating to some extent. But if we treat the remote memory uh, extinction paradigm with an HDEC inhibitor, we boost this capacity again, and thereby even remote memories can be extinguished. So that's how much we have done on this, on this side of things. So any other question from uh, the audience um, uh, or in the chat? Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, so what could be also the role of this epigenetic modification along uh, normal aging and uh, whether that also could uh, help to explain decline, cognitive declines and yeah, that's a, that's a hot area of, of research in the field. So uh, there are various groups working on this and the, from the studies that have surfaced so far, the, the changes are drastic. So there is a substantial rearrangement of the epigenome going on the older you get. I mean, this is mouse work, obviously. And uh, different anti-aging treatments such as caloric restriction or a treatment with uh, activating compounds of the sirtuins which itself is a histone deacetylase, have been shown to, uh, to, to rescue this to some extent. So clearly there's, uh, this is, um, there, 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 there's substantial evidence that things change as you age, not unexpectedly. And very interestingly also, what's quite interesting is, you know, I mean, we look at each other and uh, you can guess my age, but my biological age might not be my chronological age. Mm -hmm. And actually, your age can be read out on the epigenetic profile of, uh, of your blood mm -hmm. cells, which is termed an epigenetic clock. And these mm -hmm. clocks are so precise that I can tell you how much you smoked, you know, 20 years ago. Okay, mm -hmm. so this mm -hmm. is fascinating. So there seems to be really a long term installment of these epigenetic modifications that definitely uh, alter some function and that we can still read out. Yeah, fascinating. Um, okay, so um, I guess uh, we can um, we can uh, keep discussing about all these uh, later in the um, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, there is actually one question regarding whether we are, are recording uh, the the talks and and yes, uh, Pablo, uh, I guess we are recording all the talks and I guess this will be. Uh, uh, show it to uh, at some point we will uh, we will release this in the in the web so well, yeah. well, ju just a clarification we are recording some of the sessions of those speakers that allow us to do uh, and some others not so we will be only able to share those uh, mm -hmm. those uh, talks okay mm -hmm. okay good so uh, with this I think that we can we can conclude this um, the second part of the of the symposium and thanks again to the speakers and all people participants uh, who are there uh, questions answers and this um, uh, and then we will get back at uh, 2 p.m right pablo exactly uh, exactly yeah. said. okay thank you if you have something else to say that no no just that, that I, I, I wish you a very good lunch uh, um, unfortunately we cannot do it together but uh well we see each other after the, the lunch break at uh, 2 p.m. Spanish time. Okay? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.